the Miami Gardens Church of Christ. We certainly apologize for the delay this morning. Uh, and we're thankful for our engineers who have mitigated, resolved each and every technical difficulty. Uh, and we want to just jump right in. And as I've heard many pilots say on flights I've been on, uh, we are slightly delayed, but we will make it up once we get airborne. Uh, and so at this time, let us go to God in prayer. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, our Father, we're thankful for yet another day. We're thankful for life, health, and strength. We pray that everything that is studied this morning will be done in such a way that all who are present, both in person and online, will be edified to the point of action, improving our lives and growing closer to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Much is said this time of the year as it relates to uh, the birth of Christ. And as for any of the members of the Miami Garden Church of Christ, we put in the bulletin an article that just breaks down some historical stuff that has zero spiritual significance, but it gives you context. But most importantly, I want to just, let me just say it for the record. December 25th, there is no biblical account of Jesus being born on December 25th. So don't, be, don't wake up. Now, you can open a gift. That's nothing wrong with that. You can eat some food, enjoy family, but don't go work around to my happy birthday, Jesus. This is, let me just say that for the record. So less about the birth of Christ, which is a significant historical event, but his death, his burial and resurrection leads us to a lesson today that is evangelistic in nature, and it's what's in Christ. If you are uh, with us today, and I'm, I'll go through this rather quickly, but I promise anybody who wants this PowerPoint, we will send it to you. We'll send you the recording so you can go ahead and, and help not only yourself first and foremost, but also uh, ensure that others you may know, friends and family, know what they must do to get in Christ, to be saved, to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if you have a piece of paper, put a line right down the middle. And on the top left, put in. On the top right, put out. In and out. That's, that's going to be the pattern. Not real deep theologically uh, or practically, but very deep theologically. You, you know what that means in a minute. In Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 4, rather, beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, that this man stand here before you whole. Watch this now. Verse 11. This is the stone, talking about Jesus, which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is that cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, if you will. And so now, based on uh, when you think about what uh, is said in terms of by the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, what that means is by the authority. So in verse 12, here it is, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Point number one, salvation is only in Christ. And a very special thank you. And I'm going to call his name, Mr. Bob Boyd in Arizona. We've been co corresponding since early this morning, earlier for him than for me. Uh, but the bottom line is I hope and trust and pray that he's on here with us because he's got a form that was given to him so he can fill this in very nice and neatly. So I want everybody to understand. Point one, salvation is only in Christ. So our lesson today is what's in Christ, a lesson we've taught here every year, minimum of once a year, but it's evangelistic in nature. A little historical context, one of my mentors, uh, Brother Doris Pitts, West Oakland Church of Christ, when he taught me this lesson in his home, he had a little study, uh, long, good, great gospel preaching, not good, great gospel preaching. He sat us down, me and Rick, and walked through this lesson, it changed my life. I have taught more people this lesson uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what they must do to be saved than any other lesson I've ever taught. So it's dear to me, not only from me being trained as a young minister back in the day, but watch how simple it is. And we're going to go left to right in terms of what's in Christ using scripture to do all the explanation. So Acts 4 and verse number 12, we just read it. Uh, salvation is only in Christ Jesus. So if salvation is only in Christ Jesus, what's out of Christ? See, the Bible uses absolute language. 
See, if salvation's only in Christ, and engineers, I appreciate you staying with me today because I got a lot of animation in terms of the screen and everything. If salvation is only in Christ and outside of Christ, there is no salvation. If you could only get groceries here in, in Florida at Winn-Dixie, then you can't get anything in Publix. Y'all got that? If you could only buy a Chevy, there would be no food. If there was only Apple, there would be no Android for the youngsters, if you will. If there was only Xbox, there would be no PlayStation. And so when it comes to religion, man struggles with this. John the Baptist can't save you. Elijah Muhammad, Mother Teresa, now, certainly not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Ain't that something? People bow down to Mary. But it wasn't about Mary. Mary was the medium. Mary was, Mary was the, the vessel through which God sent his son in the flesh. But it's not about Mary being exalted. Some people bow down to Peter, the first pope, quote unquote. That's a lie as well. Let me continue. So if salvation's only in Christ. Then out of Christ, there is no salvation. In Ephesians chapter one, verse three and seven. Some scriptures I may have to quote for time's sake, like this one, uh, Ephesians one verse, you turn to it. I'm gonna quote some for time because we got to make up some, some time in the air because I want to get through this lesson. The Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every or all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing or all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, when you think about that, what's in Christ? Based on Ephesians 1 verse 3, all, every spiritual blessing. What is a blessing? A blessing by definition is a benefit. A blessing is a benefit. Some people say, look at that car, I'm blessed. Look at that home, I'm blessed. Look at my bank account, I'm blessed. Money won't save you. Car won't save you. The house won't save you. Those are material benefits based on you either having a good job, somebody likes you, you got a nice inheritance, but those are material blessings. So what are the spiritual blessings? Drop down to verse seven. In whom we have redemption. In whom, we talk about in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So the spiritual blessing, the spiritual benefit are forgiveness of sins. So you may not have a car. You may not have a home. You may not have a huge bank account. Let me tell you something. You can still be a Christian. Amen, saints. So all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Why did I bold all and only? Because that's absolute language. If all or every spiritual blessing is in Christ, I want the auditorium to help me. So if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, then what's out of Christ? I heard, I heard, I heard something. Hopefully I heard that. No spiritual blessing. If all spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing is in Christ, then outside of Christ, there's no spiritual blessings. You cannot be forgiven outside of Christ. Amen, if y'all understand that. You cannot be redeemed outside of Christ. Amen, Zoom, if you understand what I'm saying. So every spiritual blessing is in Christ. If I could be forgiven outside of Christ, there would be no need for me to be baptized. And Christ only built one church, so if salvation wasn't only in Christ, I could be saved in the Baptist church. I could be saved in the Pentecostal church. I can go down to, watch this, and it's funny how they elevate people. I can go to St. Peter, St. Thomas, St. Mark. See, those were just instruments, vessels that accompanied Christ. They were never designed, never intended to have their own benefits, their own church. Amen, saints. Y'all all right? All right. All right, Deacon, I appreciate that. So salvation's only in Christ. Outside of Christ, no salvation. All spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. Blessing means benefit. All spiritual benefits are in Christ. Outside of Christ, no spiritual blessings. Let's talk about condemnation for a minute. Turn to Romans 8, verse number 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Like I said, I got to quote the first few to catch up a little bit. Romans 8, verse 1. Y'all turn over there. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. 
I'll go ahead and start start reading or for this one. I'm gonna quote again just for time's sake. We're almost caught up. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let's break that down for a minute. There is therefore now no condemnation. Break down condemnation, teacher, eternal destruction to them which are in Christ Jesus. So who are those that avoid destruction? Those that are in Christ. Well, why is that important? Because that's where salvation is. Another word for salvation means to be rescued. So we are rescued, delivered, saved from eternal destruction by being in Christ. The material benefit, excuse me, the spiritual benefit, spiritual benefit of being in Christ is we are forgiven of our sins. We're not, we're not declared guilty. So now let's go back to Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But here's where we need to be clear. If you have NIV, this is in your footnote. And I'd be translation of the Bible. So be careful with some of those translations that are going to footnote key things. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? What is the Bible saying? Let's break it down very quickly. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ who live by the word of God. See, the Bible said that when the Bible says who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit to walk means to live who those that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, because you can have Christians. Let me just pause here. Christians can be worldly. Christians cannot abide by the word of God. Amen, saints. So there will be some Christians who will be condemned, not because they were Christians, but because they did not continue to live by the word. What did Jesus say? Be faithful until to death. Revelation 2 and 10. And I will give you the crown of life. And so to be clear, when you think about what's in Christ, there's no condemnation, no eternal destruction to those who are in Christ. That's a prerequisite. You can't say I'm in the world. I live good moral life. Morality won't save you. To those in Christ who walk, live by the word of God. Amen. So if there's no condemnation in Christ, hopefully you picked up on the pattern of teaching now. If there's no condemnation in Christ for those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And someone may say, well, brother, that you say word, but the scripture says spirit. Well, you got to put in Ephesians 6 and verse 17. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So when you're cut, convicted, pricked, moved by the word, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us into all truth by the word. So let me continue. So if there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who live by the word of God outside of Christ, this is the only time you will have something outside of Christ that's not in Christ. And you don't want this. You don't want this. There's condemnation. If you do not get into Christ and you die, God has made it clear through his word. Don't take my word for it. The Bible just told us there's no condemnation, no eternal destruction. When Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. Depart from me means you will be cast into eternal destruction. Where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25. That gives me pause. That's what keeps me straight. I'm the husband I am because I love God first. And Chantel is a beneficiary of my love for God and my love for her. Amen. I'm the father I am today because of my love for God. My kids are beneficiaries of my faithfulness to God and my love for them. See, it's got to be that order. Let me continue on. I've got you some practical application. So is everybody good so far? The engineers are tracking with me perfectly. So Acts 4 and verse 12, salvation is only in Christ. Outside of Christ, no salvation. Ephesians 1, verse 3 and 7, all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. If every spiritual blessing is in Christ, outside of Christ, no spiritual blessing. So this, I'm blessed and highly favored. If you are a non-Christian, you can't even say those words. You're lying. I'm blessed and highly favored. Based on what? That's a very, that's a big catchphrase in the world. I don't know if y'all caught that. You go to somebody and say, good morning, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. 
when did you obey the gospel? I obeyed the gospel. I'm going on to Reverend uh, Ike's church over here, the Holy Ghost Baptist Church. No, you ain't blessing Holly Faith, but I'm sorry. I don't mean you any harm, but that is, you don't understand scripture. Because to be blessed, you got to be in Christ. I'm trying not to preach this. I'm trying my best not to preach this thing, Joshua. Let me bring it down. I'll preach later on. If you are in Christ, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing, forgiveness of sins, redemption through his blood. We can go to the Father in Jesus' name. Outside of Christ, no spiritual blessing. Romans 8, verse 1. If we are in Christ and live according to the word, there's no condemnation. Outside of Christ, condemnation. I'm trying to keep that teaching pace. Such a thing. What's in Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Turn your Bibles over there. I have now caught up to where I want to be. So I will turn over there with you. Only reason I quoted those first few wasn't to show off. I needed to make up some time. Thank God for a little memory. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So what's in Christ? You think about creature, creation, new versus old. So in Christ, to put it clearly, is we are new creatures. Now, new creation. Remember Nicodemus talking to Jesus? How can a man enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? So being born again, you know, again, you're six foot, two or three. You need anything like you're going to be born again. I want to come back six foot six like Michael Jordan. I want to be a little taller. No, you're not talking about a physical recreation. We're talking about a spiritual. It's a new, you're a new creature in Christ. So what's in Christ? New spiritual creatures. We're still the same height, weight, whatever. So physically, we're still the same, Brother Charles. But spiritually, we have a clean slate. That's why we talk about our sins are washed away. We're new creatures spiritually. So that's what's in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. What's out of Christ? The old man of sin. So old man, old creature, new man, new creature. So what's in Christ? New creatures, new spiritual creation in Christ Jesus. Physically, as I said, I just want to reinforce that. Physically, we're still the same person spiritually. We are now a child of God. As we continue with what's in Christ, and I hope I'm gonna be, I'll do a run through, and I want to make sure, especially you in the auditorium, hope you're taking notes. I'm gonna take you from Acts four all the way down when we finish this lesson. It's like a fireworks display. That's gonna be the the crescendo, the climax, if you will, to make sure that everybody understands how simplistic this word is, but how powerful it is as well. The next topic within this what's in Christ lesson speaks to death. Everybody hates talking about death, but the Bible is very explicit when it comes to death. What do you mean, preacher? In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Turn over there with me. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So the Bible is making it plain, and as it is appointed, we will not avoid death. There must be a separation. Mortality must put on immortality. Our fleshly bodies cannot deal with, dwell in the afterlife. There is immortality, either living forever with God or the drastic alternative, Gehenna, condemnation. And so the Bible says, the Hebrew writer says, it is appointed unto man. I talk all the time about appointments. Sometimes uh, we're on time. Sometimes we're running behind. Uh, some people think on time is five minutes late. That's us. But there's one appointment we will, ne we will be on time for. And if we know that, then let's go to 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. There are some that would say, well, this is a, uh, there's an error in the Bible. No, sir. No, ma'am. Because they don't understand the translation. Second Peter 3 and 9. Watch this. The word perish means to die. Perish means to die. Here we go. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his, 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. Wait a minute, Peter just said God's not willing that any should die. But the Hebrew writer said it's appointed unto men once to die. We just caught God in a mistake. No, you did but that all should come to repentance. We are talking about two distinct types of death, physical death and spiritual death. Amen, if you understand. So we will physically die, but we don't have to spiritually die. Death means separation. And so what's in Christ? Here it is. I'll summarize it very concisely on the screen for you, for your notes. All will die physically. There's your Hebrew 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men, unto man, unto mankind, once to die. There it is right there. All will die physically. The flesh will not last forever. I don't care how many push-ups, jumping jacks. You may be vegan. You may love barbecue ribs. Whatever it is, take care of yourself. But one day we will expire. That's not to be doom and gloom. That's just straight Bible as it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. See that judgment is based on how you live, but it's a spiritual judgment. So all will die physically. But in 2 Peter 3 and 9, God is not willing that any perish spiritually. Spirit, see, in, in Christ, we have physical death, but no condemnation, no spiritual death, if we live according to the word. Let me say that again. In Christ, we have, we will, Christians die. That's not breaking news. We've lost some pillars this year. Christians die. But God is not willing that any should be separated from him spiritually, that any should perish spiritually. Outside of Christ, non-Christians die physically. And outside of Christ, there is spiritual separation from God eternally. You have physical and spiritual death outside of Christ. Everybody all right? As we think about the power of God's word and the simplicity of what's in Christ, let's go to the back of the book, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. If we know that we will die physically and we know that if we are faithful until death, then we should be motivated to just stay faithful to God. And so if I'm outside of Christ right now and I'm listening to what's going on, what's being taught, I want to get in Christ as soon as I can. because We don't know when we're going to die. Revelation 14 and verse 13, what's in Christ? Let's read the scripture first and we'll expound upon it. Revelation 14 and verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead, watch this, which die in the Lord. I got a pause right there. So clearly, yet again, there is no biblical error. The death in Hebrews 9 is a physical death. The perish, the death, in 2 Peter 3 and 9 is a spiritual one. God is not willing. It is not God's will that anybody go to hell. Gehenna, not just a Hadean world. We all go to Hadean world, post-death, post-physical death. But it's not, it's God's will. God wants everybody to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. Amen? So, Revelation 14, 13, and I heard a voice of heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead, which die, which we all will, in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the spirit, that they, who are they? Those who die in the Lord, in Christ, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That pronoun, they, them, their, speaks to those who die in the Lord. You cross-reference Romans 8 and 1 with that, those that walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, we got to die in the Lord faithfully. There are Christians who have died 
The hardest funerals to preach are those outside of Christ, because we will still preach the gospel, but those who are in Christ, who we know were not faithful. And people say, well, at least they were in the Lord. Well, it ain't enough just to be in the Lord. Let me say, let me be clear. It's not enough just to be in the Lord. You got to be faithful in the Lord. So Revelation 14, 13, what's in Christ? There it is. It's a blessing. Blessed, the Bible says in Revelation 14, in verse 13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Keep your notes up to date. It's a, I have it on the screen for your convenience. Take a picture of it if you don't write fast. You can capture it. Should have told you that in the beginning. It's a blessing to die in the Lord. The spiritual benefit of dying faithfully in the Lord is eternal rest. R-I-P, rest in peace, only applies to those who have died faithfully in the Lord. So if there is eternal rest, if it's a blessing to die in the Lord, what's outside of Christ? There's no rest. Torment. When we look at Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Rich man died. He says, can you send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water? For I am, starts with a T, tormented in these flames. That's Luke 16, verse 19 and following. But Lazarus also died. Death does not discriminate. Lazarus died. And the Bible said he was carried away into, by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Bosom, a place of rest. Two distinct, two different people, both die physically, but two distinct places after they die. What's in Christ is a blessing to die in the Lord because we can have eternal rest. Out of Christ, no rest. Let me pause here. So I've sat through many of quote unquote presentation. I won't call it a sales presentation, but that's what it was, a presentation. Brother Steve, I've sat through presentations when I was going up to Orlando one time. They said, we'll give you a two-night free hotel stay. Get up there anyone, but just sit through this presentation. They're trying to sell you something. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I thought, just, well, let me just take Chantel up here and just hang out for free. You know better than that. And there's, there's always a point where they make that transition. And I remember guys walking, going when we were down south. A guy came by the house selling knives, and he's going through all this other stuff. And he said, is this the best knife you've ever seen? I'm like, it cuts? What's a knife going to do? As long as it cuts, I'm good. He said, so how many do you want? And so a good salesperson would say, don't say, ask you if you want it. It's how many? But see, I'm not selling anything. And see, a good person, a person who's seeking to show you value of something, you should be able to see it for yourself without anybody doing any extra talking. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let me pause for a minute. <clears throat> Based on what you've seen in Christ, what's in Christ? Let's do a run, <clears throat> a rundown. Excuse me, one second. Let me get some, get a little sip of water here. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Based on what you've seen in Scripture, Acts four and twelve, salvation is only in Christ. Ephesians one should be in your notes. Ephesians one three and seven, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Romans eight and one. No condemnation to those who live according to the word of God in Christ. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, new creatures, new spiritual creation in Christ Jesus. Talked about Hebrews 9 and 2 Peter 3 and 9, how God's not willing that any should die spiritually. Revelation 14, 13, it's a blessing to die in the Lord if we are faithful. I hope, trust, and pray that everybody who's seen and heard what we've done thus far sees the clear necessity of being in Christ. Say amen if you believe that in this auditorium. Amen. It's a blessing to be in Christ. So now here we go. Why do I, why do I, because I need to make a transition now. Why did I do that? Because here we go. How do I get into Christ? I can't, I'm not selling you a thing because the price has already been paid. So if you see all the benefits of being in Christ, your question should be, whoever you may be, if you're outside of Christ, outside the church of Christ, your question should be, how do I get into Christ? Here it is, Galatians 3 and verse 27. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. We are baptized into Christ. 
Now, Mr. Bob Boyd, on your worksheet, on that bottom left, put baptism in that box. He knows what I'm talking about. If there's a box on your bottom left. Put baptism in that box. Because see, again, you look at the benefits of being in Christ. You see the disadvantages, the condemnation of being outside of Christ, your left, your right side of your of your paper. Hopefully, if you're taking notes. So now we transition to baptism, the necessity of baptism. And most recently, we had an inquiry asking. And I've been asked, I see, especially around the holidays, people reach out. We just had a recent one on our website asking about baptizing a baby. I had a couple that I married years and years ago. Beautiful wedding. Two non-Christians. And about three years later, they said, we would like you to baptize our baby in the ocean. We got everything set up. It'll be beautiful. I said, there's no way. No, I said, you need to be baptized. And that baby does not need to be baptized because the baby does not know the difference between right and wrong. See, baptism, and we're going to get to this right now, baptism washes away your sins. So, there's no, so there is no need for anyone out there thinking they need to baptize whether it's a nine-month-old or whether it's a two-month-old. There's no need for a baby to be baptized. Quote, unquote, Christian. That is not in the Bible. Let me move on. Amen? How do you get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. What? Now, why is baptism so important? Because in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, I'm hastening on now. We, the Bible says we are baptized into one body. We are baptized into one body. Now, what are we talking about with the body? How many bodies does the Bible talk about? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. There is one body. There is one body. And so when we think about that one body, what is that one body? There it is. Colossians chapter one and verse 18. The body is the church. In Colossians one and verse 18, the Bible records, you write that down and read it for yourself. And he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the body. That's Colossians 1 and verse 18. So as you think about the body being the church, then Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. Paul writes and lets us know that the church is the body. Watch this. Let me turn over there. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Watch this. And had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, it's important that you get these pronouns. Let me put this on the screen for your, your convenience. Let me go back. Sorry. Let me go back. So in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, the, we know that the body is the church, but now the church is the body. So look at the he and the hymns in verse 22. And had put all things under his feet. See, the Father put under the Son and gave him, Jesus Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church belongs to Christ. The church is under Christ's authority. That is why it is the church of Christ. It is not St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Peter. None. They follow Christ. The church, amen, saints, belongs to Christ. This ain't Peter's church. Jesus, I will give thee the keys to the kingdom. You will preach the gospel. You will spread the good news about me. The church belongs to Christ. So how do I get into Christ? You must be baptized into Christ. You're baptized into one body. I'm just rehashing what's on your screen. You're baptized into one body. There is only one body. And according to Colossians 1 and verse 18, he, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. And according to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the Father gave him, Jesus Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is, which is his body. And so as we close, you cannot have Christ without his church. Let me just spend some time here for a minute. There are those who are joining us sometimes in person and many online that think, I want Christ, but 
but I still want to be a part of my church. It just doesn't work that way. You cannot be a Christian. And these are fighting words for some people. And I wanted to say this now. Christians, there are not Christians in every church. There are God, quote unquote, God fear. People have a fear of God, but they haven't obeyed the gospel. That don't make you a Christian. You have people who believe in God, will proclaim Jesus Christ. That doesn't make them a Christian. And I'm glad this is being recorded because I want everybody to understand who are listening. And during the holiday season, people get, quote unquote, religious. Jesus Christ did not die for every church. When the Bible plainly states, and you have the scriptures, let me go back to that slide. When the Bible states there is one body, if you have one dollar, there is no disputing how much money you have. You got one car. He's like, which one am I going to take? You only have one. Amen. I didn't say which wife am I bringing to church. I only got one. Amen, Hogan. Chantel said, you better make me get that right one. There is no choice. So why is it when it comes to the spiritual things? Man makes it confusing. We're baptized into one body. We're baptized into Christ. I didn't put the scripture on here, but you can write down Acts 22 and 16. Baptism washes away our sins. That's a spiritual benefit. One body, one church. And so with that in mind, when we look at who we are as children of God and who you are that may be listening today that are outside the body of Christ, you cannot have Christ without his church. You get in Christ, you are added to one body, one church, not the church of your choice. Here it is. First Corinthians 12 and verse 27. And we'll go ahead and read that. First Corinthians 12 and verse 27. I literally have two minutes left and I'm right on time. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, the Bible says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now watch this. Even for those of you that are on the on Zoom, put in the chat, what is the body? Put it in there right now. I can't see it, but I'm going to read it in a minute. Who, what is the body? And I want you in auditorium to help me as we wrap up this lesson. What is the body? Amen, Saint. The church is what I heard. And what is the church? The body. Thank you, Deacon. There it is. So if the body is the church and the church is the body, now I want you all on Zoom and in this auditorium. How many, when the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, how many bodies are there? One. Say it like you mean it. One. So if the body is the church and the church is the body, and there's only one body, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth and saying, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Ye are the body, ye are the church of Christ and members in particular. Church of Christ, yes, sir. Romans 16 and verse 16. Salute one another with that holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. But brother, you just said there's only one body, only one church. That's what the Bible said. Don't try to put it on me. That's what the Bible said. The church is of Christ salute you. You know what that is? When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, one congregation, it's one universal body, different locations, not different denominations. One church preaching, teaching the same thing. First Corinthians 10, First Corinthians 1 and 10. Amen? One body, one church, different locations. If you're in Arizona, there's a church of Christ. You're in Brownsville, Texas. There's a church of Christ. Dayton, Ohio, church of Christ. Miami Gardens, Florida, there's a church of Christ. One body, different locations. So when you see churches of Christ, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. He wrote to the church at Galatia. He wrote to the church at Colossae. Amen. That's what we're talking about. One body, different locations. And so as we close out this Bible study, God's plan of salvation, all roads lead to getting in Christ. Hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that he died, he was buried and rose again the third day. Be willing to change your mind, repent of your sins. Confess Christ to be the son of God. And upon that confession, not a baby, but a, an understanding adult, 
or a child who knows the difference between right and wrong and is willing not only to confess Christ, but to be, to be submit, to submit to immersion in water, baptism, that washes away your sins. You're added to one body and baptism puts you in Christ. Be faithful unto death and we avoid eternal condemnation. It is 946. I'm one minute over. Forgive me. But the bottom line is you now know what's in Christ. And we just pray that you will respond before it's too late. Let us pray and brothers will meet as we prepare for worship. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we're thankful for the opportunity and the privilege to teach your word. We pray, dear God, that what was stated and what was taught today, there was no addition or subtraction or anything or any such thing. We pray that all that are here and those that are tuning in will recognize the necessity of getting into Christ, your son, and by obeying the gospel before it's too late. Thank you for the privilege and honor of teaching. And we ask that you be with us as we prepare to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you at 10.